how are they drawing these conclusions? I'm right here doing this work and we have no clue how to build systems that solve the problems that they say are imminent, that are right around the corner. Hi, this is Dr. Jed McCosco at Academic Influence and Wake Forest University. And today we have Eric Larson, who's just written an incredibly powerful, insightful book on the myth of artificial intelligence. And I want to hear more about this book. So Eric, tell me how you got started writing this book and what it's all about. Well, I, I mean, in terms of getting started, I had been thinking about this going all the way back to college days. Um, and I think what sort of prompted it was when I was actually working in the field, I kept hearing the futurist talk from Kurzweil and other people who who should know better. I mean, Kurzweil himself is very technical and is uh, he, he won the Medal of Technology for helping develop the, the voice recognition systems and so on. And so I kept there was this mismatch. Um, so I, I sort of started in college and had these philosophical questions about AI. And then when I was working actually as a computer scientist or what broadly speaking, an AI scientist, there was, I saw this huge mismatch between the stuff that we were doing and my field is, is a uh, natural language processing. So that's directly relevant to the Turing test, right? So, um, understanding language is what I work on natural language, like English, French, and so on. And, uh, and what the futurists were talking about in the media and everywhere else. And I was thinking like, how are they drawing these conclusions? I'm right here doing this work and we have no clue how to build systems that solve the problems that they say are imminent, that are right around the corner. Not only do they seem not around the corner, there's a reasonable skepticism that we're ever going to find a solution short of a, a major kind of conceptual invention that we can't foresee. And if it's something that a conceptual invention sort of almost by nature, you can't foresee, and if that's what we're looking at, then all of this, the kind of predictive vocabulary and speech that these that, that these guys were are use Bostrom and so on. There's a whole constellation of people that are sort of perpetually decade by decade declaring that AI is right around the corner. And so but if we if what we need is a conceptual revolution or invention of some radical nature, and it in fact might even be not feasible at the limit, right? We may just find out that Turing machines don't produce certain kinds of intelligent behavior that human minds do, then I couldn't understand what they were talking about and from where are they drawing their data? <laughs> from what? <laughs> so I wanted to write a book that kind of cleared the air because I thought there was just a ton of confusion and I think some of it is potentially destabilizing, right? So if you if you have people declaring that that humans are are soon to be to be replaced by artificial intelligence that are far superior there's a kind of it creates kind of a real disincentive to 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 for us to do much to fix things in our own in our you know our own society so I, I think the message you know if it was forced upon us because it was a scientific truth that would be one thing but if people are just speculating about futurism for whatever motives you want to attribute or you know they could be true believers or they maybe have a market incentive to do that because they own big shares in apple or google or something and they want you know but if people are just speculating i think we needed a better discussion so i wrote the book yeah wow that is really cool so basically what you're saying is unless a robot comes back in time from the future like in uh in terminator and we get a piece of the arm and we look inside and see the chips we're not going to do this in any time soon i mean that that's what we need is some kind of breakthrough like that and that's kind of just science fiction is that what you're saying yeah i mean so a lot of the air sort of gets sucked out of the room when you talk about ai on the issue of consciousness so people will say can we build a conscious machine? And so a lot, the, the just just so much ink is spilled over this issue of whether computational systems can have minds in the sense of consciousness. But the real issue for AI scientists like myself is, can they do intelligent things that are not narrow, like play chess or play Go or play even Jeopardy, right? Like, can they actually exhibit a general intelligence what people 
like to describe now as an artificial general or intelligence or an AGI. That's the question. Whether they're conscious or not is kind of a sideshow issue that we can leave in philosophy class. What, what, what we can't leave in philosophy class as an AI scientist is what sort of intelligent behaviors can be programmed, right? So, so that I wrote the book focusing specifically on something called inference, which is given what I know and what I see, what can I conclude? And if you don't have the inference, you don't have an intelligent system, whether it's a person or a robot, no inference, no intelligence. So the limitations on inference in computational systems directly translate to the, the question about the, the future of AI. Hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so you don't really get into that whole Terminator thing in your book. You just say, you leave it kind of like the only way that we could ever experience true artificial intelligence that has this inference ability is if we got some breakthrough, uh, be it a Terminator arm, be it something else. That's what we really need, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, essentially, if you, any foreseeable extension of the capabilities that we currently have do not result in general intelligence, just point blank, they just don't. So, so, so we would need a huge leap forward, yeah, right? Yeah, there has to be something that happens. And, and so there's two possibilities that we, we have our kind of Einsteinian moment where somebody realizes, oh, the reason that we have bad measurements at 90% of the speed of light is because we had to curve space time. I mean, you're a physicist, right? And nobody thought about that. We were dealing with a, you know, a, a Euclidean sort of space. And then somebody said, no, we have to use this. Uh, Lobachevsky in space. It's like, oh, well, nobody, you know, that, that made certain measurements possible. It gave us a richer picture. In the same sense, AI doesn't need people preaching about smart machines. They need somebody to figure out the problem in this fundamental, conceptual, innovative sense. Or we need to start admitting that we overshot the goal and there might be fundamental differences between minds and machines. It's just a fact of a fact of nature, a fact of life, that we have differences and we can't join, you know, the two together in the in future in, in future development efforts. So and of those two choices, you think it's more likely that there is a fundamental difference between mind and machine rather than you think that there's a high likelihood that we're going to have this Einsteinian moment where we get the the arm of a of a Terminator robot and we see the chip inside and we're like, oh, that's what we need to do. It, it, that that first option of, of having the Einstein moment is not really likely in your book. Is that what you're thinking? Well, you don't you can't you don't have a prior probability to put on it. So you can't assess the probability of a of a conceptual innovate. Like you don't know you we don't know sort of what is possible sort of an impossibility proof itself. So if somebody could formalize the problem and show that it's impossible, like in mathematical logic or something, then that'd be one thing. But we, as far as I know, we don't have a proof, so we have to leave the door open. And it's difficult to assess probabilities when you don't have a prior, you don't, on the basis of what? And so, but I think just intuitively, if you want sort of, so I would give a disjunctive conclusion that it's either you have to wait for a miracle, effectively, or it's impossible. That's what and we're that's, looking at. That's what your book says. That's what you're yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's either one of those. Yeah, and okay. it, and that's that's as far as I could re I could stretch the argument without myself introducing you know opinions, which is what I was complaining the futurists are doing. So I wanted to make my argument very, very supported by exactly what we know about the state of the art and uh, foreseeable ex extensions of it. So, but if you want my own opinion, which sort of falls a little bit outside the scope of the book, but you know, I, yeah, I mean, if you ask me like, is my laptop going to sprout a mind or something or some, you know, server farm with, with uh, you know, super computational capacities and new algorithms and so on, that that's gonna somehow exhibit the characteristics of the human person like, I, I think that's just an incredibly bizarre thought that I don't think we should give much credence to, frankly. So my own mm -hmm. opinion is, yeah, it's just not the same thing. It's apples and oranges. You mm -hmm. know, it's it's like worrying that, you know, I, I stopped putting bagels in my toaster. I'm not particularly worried that it's it's going to start griping and, and feeling, you know, 
I mean, it's a, a computer after all is an artifact is the point. And artifacts okay. don't exhibit personhood, whether mm -hmm. it's a computer or a toaster or something. It's this fairly radical view that I have. And certainly people could take issue and try to mark territory where a computer is significantly different than other artifacts. But at the end of the day, something we design, I don't think is in the proper category of being something that exhibits personhood ever, you know? Right. How, how do you walk people through that argument? Because obviously, maybe some people pick up your book, being true believers in AI being right around the corner and, you know, becoming sentient and stuff like that. How do you kind of walk them through where even if they started off at that point, they might come around to seeing it your way? You mean, how do I do it in the book? Yeah, like what or is the structure of the book? I mean, I haven't read the book and people watching this interview might be interested in buying the book, but to give them a little taste for what you do to walk them through this argument. Yeah, I mean, so the primary, the primary uh, argument, the kind of meat of the book where people, I think a broad base of readership will be able to grab onto is, as I explain exactly what advanced AI systems from Google, from Facebook, from Twitter, from Amazon recommendation systems or movie recommendations on Netflix, like real examples of cutting edge, bleeding edge AI that we are interacting with currently that represent the state of the art. I explain what they're actually doing in terms of uh, types of inference. And, and so we actually know a lot about inference. It started back all the way with Aristotle, who gave us syllogisms, which is a kind of deductive inference using two premises and a conclusion. And it's been expanded through George Boole. You're a scientist. You know all this stuff, I'm sure. And, and, we've, and, and we've formalized huge, huge pieces of inference in logical languages. And so we know a lot about inference in the entire history of the intellectual thought. And so we can say a lot about what computers are doing with respect to inference. So we actually have a really good framework to say, like, what is this recommendation system at Netflix actually doing? It turns out it's doing induction from prior example. And if it's doing induction from prior example, it's fairly straightforward to explain how it inherits all the problem of induct induction for purposes of general intelligence. And induction won't give you general intelligence. It just won't. Mm -hmm. And likewise, deduction, and these systems can be hybrids and use combinations of deduction and induction. For instance, IBM's Watson system that played Jeopardy and now does all kinds of things. It had a kind of abortive attempt in the healthcare industry, but I think that it's, it's now it's sort of still spreading its tentacles out as a business model for, for IBM under their cognitive computing labs and but it originally started with a, a hybrid system that the guy named Dave Ferrucci who now works in Wall Street he's a very very smart guy uh, designed with a team a very big team of people who brought a lot of human intelligence into dissecting the Je the game of jeopardy and getting that computer to actually um, be able to beat Ken Jennings and the Grand Masters in 2011 it actually beat all the humans and that system uses a combination of deduction and induction. And so we call it a hybrid system. But even those hybrid systems inherit all the limitations of deduction and all the known limitations of induction. And we know, we, could, we very straightforwardly know that they can't reach human general intelligence. We have something that's called abduction, which is kind of an unfortunate word because it brings up like abducting children. It brings this, it has this <laughs> other connotation. Yeah. But abduction or retroduction is kind of reasoning from observation to likely hypotheses, and it does not are plausible explanations of what we see. And it turns out that we, as we go through our life, most of our life are abductions. Most mm. of our, our inferences that we make, just walking down the street, going to the supermarket, making sense of a conversation with your neighbor, those are all actually not inductive or deductive, but abductive inferences. So given that we need this to be general and flexible in our own human intelligence and, and computers absolutely can't reproduce that type of inference, that they have to make use of induction and deduction to make these hybrid systems. And we know that these are actually, that one cannot be subsumed into the other. There's a lot, there are theorems that actually prove that you can't hmm. reduce the one to the other. 
we already know that we don't have AGI by any foreseeable extension of Google or of these companies that are saying that they're on the brink of, we know that they're not. <laughs> we just know that they're not. So if somebody reads the book, I make that very, very clear. I, I try to. So, yeah. I cannot wait. So it comes out in April, right? Yeah, April 6th. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much for giving us a sneak peek at your book. I cannot wait for people to start reading it, myself included, my daughter, everybody who uh, I know who's interested in this topic. So thank you for spending the time with us today. Well, thank you, Jed. I appreciated the opportunity.